Good morning, I'm Father X, and today we'll discuss one of the most important strategic tools you need to help you get 50-50 or primary custody of your kids. So watch this to the end. We'll talk about the sexy topic of case law and prior appellate court decisions. In this episode, 10A, we'll talk about why you absolutely need to know case law. And in the next episode, 10B, we'll talk about the mechanics of how to research case law using Google Scholar. I've never found anybody in the entire family court system, including lawyers, that teaches what we'll discuss here. When I saw my judge making illogical decisions about our son's best interests, I started reading case law from the appellate courts in my state to see how they made decisions on other child custody cases because lower court judges are required to follow these decisions. I read over a hundred cases and discovered my judge was ignoring the higher court's guidance. Case law taught me how to argue, present my case, and choose the right evidence. After I read these cases, I had more expertise in family law after one year than practitioners with 15 years of experience. I'm not saying that to brag, I'm saying it because it shows what an embarrassment the family court system is to our society. So don't rely on them. You must learn it yourself. If you haven't read case law, it might sound unbelievable, but After reading several cases, you'll see the difference. Case law became my powerful tool, and I want you to use this tool, too, to protect your children. If your judge is incompetent or gender-biased, this can help you corner and control your judge, handcuffing their ability to simply rubber stamp the mother for custody. So let's get to it. Prepare your case backwards. First, we'll talk about the steps in a custody case from beginning to end, and then I'm going to show you how to prepare your case backwards, starting with the end goal. In a custody case, here are the key steps. First, you file petitions asking for primary or 50-50 custody of your kids. Second, you have several 15-minute status conferences over many months where there's little fact-finding, but the mom probably gets default primary custody. During that period, you might also have a third-party evaluator, like a forensic psychologist or guardian ad litem. Then, you have the actual trial where each parent testifies and submits evidence, and witnesses might testify, including the third-party evaluator, and both sides cross-examine each other. When the trial is over, then you provide your closing arguments, verbally or in writing. Then, the judge makes a final decision and order. If that final decision goes against you, then you can appeal the decision to a higher court. But here's the mistake that many people make during the trial process and appeal. In an appeal, you must prove the judge made an error in law, which means the judge didn't follow the written law or case law, or you have to show the judge's decision was unreasonable based on the testimony and evidence. For example, in the case of Deloche v. Deloche in 1997, This appellate court said, While our authority in custody matters is as broad as that of family court, we do give deference to its factual findings, since it has the opportunity to observe the witness's demeanor and assess credibility. We will not disturb those findings unless they lack a sound and substantial basis in the record. So if the judge doesn't apply sound reasoning in their final order, they can be overturned. Let's assume a simple scenario. We discuss that the best interest of the child can be determined based on 12 to 20 factors, as I shared in episode 5a. There are 50 states with 50 sets of laws. But to show how this works and keep it simple, let's create an imaginary state called XYZ, where only the child's educational needs matter in determining custody. Assume the state law only says, primary custody of the child shall be given to the parent better able to meet the child's educational needs. In state XYZ, other parents have appealed their custody decisions, so you research that state's case law on Google Scholar, such as I showed you in episode 6D. For this imaginary state XYZ, let's assume you found two relevant cases related to the child's educational needs. The appellate court is just telling the story of how they decided custody for these two parents. In the first sample case, The appellate court decided the educational needs were met by the parent who did homework daily with the child, met frequently with the teachers, read to the child every day, 
And in the second case, you see the appellate court gave custody to the parent that compared different schools and chose the best one and found tutors to help their kid in algebra. So in this sample state XYZ, where the law says only the child's educational needs matter in determining custody, if your trial judge gave the mother custody and only said it's because the mother has a nice smile, the mother is a loving parent, and the mother has extended family who can help care for the child, well, none of that has to do with her ability to educate the child. So in your appeal, you would say the judge got her decision wrong because she applied the wrong legal standard to determine custody and made an error in law. But then you have to show the appellate court that you proved at trial that you were better able to educate the child. And this means that in your testimony and evidence, you would have had to prove that you did your child's homework with them. You went to speak to the teachers and you read to your child frequently. During the appeals process, it's too late to introduce new evidence and then claim the judge didn't consider all this new evidence that you never produced during the trial. Here's why I suggest preparing your case backwards, and yes, I mean backwards. In this simplified scenario with state XYZ, start by reading appellate case law for your state's appellate division, focusing on cases that discuss determining custody based on who's the better educational parent. These cases provide examples of how parents successfully prove their case. Once you know the case law, it's your guide to how your judge is required to decide by law. Next, begin drafting your final closing arguments, even as a basic outline. It can end up around 10 to 20 pages, covering the examples from your trial that prove you're the better educational parent. And you quote the relevant statute and case law, emphasizing the better educational parent's right to primary custody. Next, after drafting your closing arguments, prepare for the trial phase. You prepare your testimony for trial to ensure you present evidence and statements showing you're the better educational parent. The evidence at trial will then flow into your final summary. Remember, you can't introduce new evidence or testimony in your final summary. The time to introduce that is during the trial. If there's a third party evaluator like a psychologist or guardian ad litem, share with them all your evidence and testimony proving you're the better educational parent. This helps ensure that their final report supports your case, which is helpful for the judge and the appellate courts to grant you primary custody. If you spend your testimony talking about how you should get custody because you have more friends, you're better at baseball, you know how to change diapers, None of these addresses whether you're able to educate your child. You have to be on point. And if you complain that the other parent is an alcoholic, that's also useless. Unless you connect it to the child's education by showing they're often too drunk to do homework with the child. Because you have to link the facts to the core legal question about education. Understanding appellate case law is key to presenting your testimony and evidence correctly. Many people get this wrong. Then they lose at trial and have no chance of winning an appeal. This was a very simple example because as I discussed in episode 5A, there are about 12 key best interest factors to be analyzed in deciding primary custody. In your case, you would do the same work for all the best interest factors that apply, not just one or two. Before I continue, please like, subscribe, and share. Also, if you find this information helpful, please support this channel. Donate on my YouTube channel's About page using PayPal or Venmo. Many fathers think they're being discriminated against during these short 15-minute meetings where nobody talks about anything, but the judge ignores your rights and still gives the mother temporary primary custody. I know that's frustrating because it happened to me. However, this is a part of the broken system that you have to emotionally endure. Recognize it's a tactic lower courts use to discourage fathers. Your opportunity to create a good outcome will most likely happen during the trial phase where you present your evidence and testimony aligned with how the Court of Appeals makes their decisions. If things are going against you before you get to trial, don't let that stop you from presenting the best case you can during the trial, because that's what matters the most. That's where you can corner and control your judge with the facts. When it comes to determining which party is credible or not, 
and who's lying, the appellate courts usually defer to the trial judge to decide that because he was there observing the witness's testimony and assessing credibility. The judge's trial discretion is a huge risk for you, especially if they're incompetent or gender biased against dads. For example, if each parent simply claims, I do homework with our child every night and the other parent does not, then if the judge decides the mother was telling the truth, the appellate courts will generally not disagree with that. Because of this risk, you must prove that you're the better educational parent, not just by saying it, but by producing evidence as exhibits. Show your handwritten notes on your kids' homework assignments because you reviewed it with them. Have the teacher testify that you were the one talking to her about your child's education. Testify about the exact names of books you read with your kid and describe the routine of how you read daily. If it's he said versus she said, then you're at the mercy of the judge's discretion. You don't want to hope the judge believes you. You want to put the judge in a position where they have no choice but to believe you. That's how you corner and control your judge. The appeal process. Once your judge issues a final order, you'll have a deadline, typically 14 to 30 days, determined by your state's rules, to file a one-page notice of appeal. This document notifies the appellate court and the opposing party, the mother, of your intent to appeal. Missing this deadline, even by one day, forfeits your right to appeal, so don't miss that deadline. Following the notice of appeal, you'll have three to nine months, depending on your own state's rules, to submit your full appeal. This includes submitting the trial record, transcripts, and exhibits to the appellate court, ensuring they see exactly what your judge saw. And you'll provide a legal brief outlining your arguments and facts supporting why the trial judge's decision should be changed. The appellate court can make one of these five decisions. Affirm the lower court's ruling, agreeing it was correct. Dismiss your appeal because you didn't submit the appropriate documents or you missed deadlines. Reverse the decision and make a new one themselves. Remand the case back to the lower court with instructions on how to fix what the lower judge got wrong, requiring a new trial. Or five, modify parts of the final decision while keeping other parts unchanged. Your goal is to win custody in the trial judge's final decision. Appealing is a last resort because it takes more time and costs more money. And worse, it's more time you don't have 50-50 or primary custody of your kids and they just get older. The main reason you prepare your case in such a way that the appellate court will agree with you is to corner and control your judge so they make the right decision the first time. That's your goal. The rules for closing arguments in family courts vary by state and court. If allowed in your state, I recommend you ask to make closing arguments. These can be verbal or in writing, but I prefer written arguments for several reasons. First, with verbal arguments, you might be limited to five to 10 minutes. You might be interrupted. The judge may not be listening and the judge may not take accurate notes. And you might have to make them immediately after testimony that same day, so you're rushed to organize and deliver your closing arguments. But with written closing arguments, you might have 15 to 60 days after the trial to submit them. And you can write everything you want to say. You can methodically write about each best interest factor and how the testimony and evidence show it's in the best interest of the child that you be the primary residential parent. You can quote statutes and case law to show the thought process the judge is required to follow. Also, the judge must summarize facts and best interest factors in their final custody decision. When I wrote my 80-page closing arguments, I was thinking like an appellate court judge, looking at the total circumstances and making a logical decision. I intentionally did the judge's job for her, and because I wrote a great summary of the facts and conclusions, she used a bunch of my language in her own final fact-finding and decision. That's what you want to have happen in your case. Lower court judges versus appellate court judges. After reading hundreds of child support and custody cases, I saw a pattern. Lower courts often make biased decisions in the best interest of the mother instead of the child, violating the law. Appellate courts often reverse these decisions, but only if the case is appealed. Imagine how many custody decisions family court gets wrong, and nobody monitors or audits this because parents don't understand how to litigate or appeal decisions. 
This broken process discriminates, discriminates against fathers, forcing them to invest significant time, money, and emotional energy. Meanwhile, the state is collecting child support and getting more Title IV-D funding from the federal government out of this process when they force working dads to be the non-custodial parent. And while you spend years going through trial, appeals, and new trials, crucial years of your kids' lives pass by without you. Lower court decisions are usually not public, but appellate court rulings are published for everyone to see. When a judge is overturned on appeal, it's embarrassing, especially if it's done by a parent without a lawyer. Culturally, many judges and lawyers wrongly assume they're smarter than non-lawyers, so it's even more embarrassing for them if you're pro se and you get their decision overturned. Judges must follow the law and rulings of the courts above them. Reading dozens of cases will help you think, speak, and write like an appellate court judge. Present your case the same way you see appellate court decisions. If you do that, you'll sound like the judge's boss. When you act like an appellate court judge and quote legal opinions from your state's higher courts, you show your judge that if they rule against you, their decision may not survive an appeal. And this can help stop a judge from engaging in their usual lazy, incompetent, or gender-biased decision-making. That's how you corner and control your judge. Knowing case law for your child custody case is like understanding the rules of a board game, like Monopoly or Parcheesi. If you don't read the rules, your opponent takes advantage of a rule, but you don't, until you learn what that rule was. But then you're already at a disadvantage. In family court, you must know the rules from the start. Learn these rules, especially the best interest factors, before talking to third-party evaluators or starting the trial. If you learn the rules after the trial, you're probably screwed. In the next episode, we'll get into how to find appellate case law for your custody case. We're going hardcore because I don't want this just to be some theoretical concept for you. These might be the darkest days of your life. They were for me. I'm making these educational videos to help you navigate this nightmare. If you subscribe, you can get updates when I post more videos. Thank you for liking, subscribing, and sharing with your friends who are in a similar situation. If you like, subscribe, and share, it'll help get this message out to more fathers. Please support this channel so I can make more videos. You can donate via my YouTube channel's About page using PayPal or Venmo.